two, one. Righto, mate. We're gone. Cool. All right, let's do it. All right, Brendan D. Murphy here, and I'm joined tonight by my mate Triff Triffin, fellow Australian, a truth seeker, fellow podcaster, knowledge seeker. What, what else is he into? Self development. He's the host of Unlocking the Code podcast, and very much into alternative history, which is what we're gonna. That's the thread we're gonna be pulling on tonight in our conversation. So, Triff. Um, without further ado, further ado, I think we're going to go sort of, as, as you said before we started, around the world and then bring it back home to Australia, arguably the, the place where it all started. Um, <laughs> very interesting story there. But yeah, let's do this. Let's talk alternative history and, you know, what, what, what's, what's missing from the mainstream? Um, where does your mind go to, to kick this journey off? Well, I think the first thing we need to say, or you know, the first thing I wanted to say is that I don't know anything. The one thing that I know is that I know nothing. However, I have put thousands of hours worth of work into this. Uh, countless books, podcasts, audio books, articles, you name it. And anything that I present to you tonight, mate, I've looked at all aspects of it. And this is the perspective that I've settled on that makes sense to me. Uh, and that's all it is. You know, anything to do with this alternative history, the reality is we don't know. We've, we've, there's a lot of clues and there's a lot of evidence However, the interpretation of that evidence is up to the observer, as we understand. Uh, and look, I just want to get it off the straight away. When we do come back to Australia, we'll be talking about Indigenous sites. We'll be talking about Indigenous people and much respect to them and, and to the ancestors of this land. However, just wanted to get that one out, mate. But where we start, I think it's more mainstream now that people understand that 12,800 years ago or thereabouts, the world ended. And it ended pretty abruptly. Now, the cause of that is in question. However, I side with the Comet Research Group. Uh, those guys posit that a uh, comet broke up, smashed into the ice shelf of North America, and basically the sea level rose 400 feet in the matter of about two weeks. Now, prior to that, there's evidence of an advanced civilization of megalith that is megalithic in nature. And one of the, sh the screens, I'd, uh, I'm going to share some stuff here. So you've got, um, we see here, there's an example of the ice sheet, okay? So that's the Cordilleran ice sheet and the Laurentide ice sheet. Theoretically, this little line that goes through the middle here, that's the corridor that everyone walked through and then killed all the manis, which is, which is not true. However, we'll get to that in a minute. But you can see here that a, an ice sheet covered majority of North America, uh, into North America and all of Canada. And they estimate that this ice sheet was up to two miles high at its peak. Think about that for a second. An ice sheet 3.2 kilometres from where you're sitting vertically. That's how thick this ice sheet was in places. And it basically, a number of objects came out of the sky, smashed into that ice sheet and basically melted all that water and the sea level rose 400 feet in a matter of about two weeks. But also while that's going on, I think it's hard to wrap your head around it. And I've been trying to wrap my head around it for many years. We've got no context, Brendan. So whilst there was a, a major flood and we could talk about the fact that every religion has a major flood myth, it was also continent-wide wildfires. There was also earthquakes. There was also volcanoes. There was also upheaval on a scale that we have no understanding. And that is basically, we are the survivors of that race. Now, when we go, and obviously Graham Hancock posited this, Fingerprints of the God, back in 93, I think. He was the one that first posited the alternative history narrative and back then they didn't have any history uh, or any evidence there used to be where's the evidence apart from the fact that there's giant triangles in Egypt apart from the fact that there's 1200 ton uh, stone blocks in Baalbek and every single megalithic society that exists around the planet I mean and the other thing too Brent is I, I come at this from a point of logistics that is what I do and I've done that for 20 years so when I look at stuff like uh, Baalbek you have a look down here. 
Uh, I've got some Balbec stuff. There's the uh, the stone of the pregnant woman. Okay, that's one of the stones that's left in the quarry at Balbec. Hey, now Trish, that, can you can you are you able to make that go full screen for us? Uh, yeah, can I? That's a good question. I'm hoping because it's quite small. How's that? Is that better? Uh, no, it hasn't, hasn't changed. It might be you, mate. If you want to minimize me. Oh, hang on a sec. Because it's full screen on my end and I can't see you. Oh, that's weird. I can see what I can see is your, like, I can see your screen in general, but I can see all your pictures, like all the small versions of them. Oh, okay. All yeah. right, hang on. Hang on. This is, uh, so if we go, so do you, what do you see now? I just see you. Okay. So what if I go, what if I go like that? Ah, uh, boom. That's it. There you go. Yeah. Sorry, mate. I had, I had to specifically select it. Technology, eh? You gotta love it. <laughs> there you go. All right. Pick it up where you left off, man. So this is one of the stones. It's a Baalbek. Okay, so Baalbek sits on a bed of, I think, nine stones, uh, and they're all bigger than this one. Okay, you're looking at about a, a stone that's about 1,200 tonne there. Now, being in logistics, I understand what it takes to move something like that. And as it sits now, we don't have the ability to not only cut that stone perfectly, but then drag it up a hill and place nine of them on top of a hill. Okay. And it's interesting that the Romans built a, a temple to the, the god of wine, the goddess of wine. It was to the wine gods anyway, on Baalbek. They marched into the desert to build a temple to the wine gods when the Romans came and took over that part of the world. And it, a lot of this stuff that I, I think we need to understand as well with these megalithic sites is that they're built on, it's the same as churches, right? They build churches on sites that were sacred to the civilization that came before. Okay, so when you talk about, yeah, here's some more Balbec stuff there. That one's not very, see if I can make that bigger. How's that? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So you can see there's one there and there's another one there. This is the quarry. The temple is up back behind you about 200 meters away. And we don't have the ability to do that now. Okay. Yet it was there. Well, supposedly the Romans did it. However, I would question that. I yeah, would question that. that. Yeah. Um, so that's Baalbek, right? So that, that's some of the evidence we're th talking about. I oh, hear some of the other Baalbek stuff. Okay, so there's the stones. You can see the Roman columns on top. And look, I would probably say that if I was to hazard a guess that the Romans have built all the stuff above the massive stones. Okay? Mm -hmm. You know, the, I'm not going to take it away from the Romans. They were pretty good at what they did. However... Oh, that's sacred grids. That's a different question. I'll stop share there, mate, because that's some other stuff. Um, but the other, so the big piece of evidence, because always, you know, Graham Hancock was lambasted for many years about the fact that there was no evidence of this advanced ancient civilization, despite the massive amount of megaliths that are around the planet. But in the, in the early 90s, a, a Turkish farmer was trying to move a stone in his field, and he couldn't. And the stone had some funny carvings on it turns out he was looking at the top of a t-shaped pillar and it was basically this, the discovery of gobekli tepe now gobekli tepe is i think at the moment i think they've uncovered six stone circles they estimate there to be at least another 20 to 50 according to ground penetrating radar and I, from 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 memory and this don't quote me on this one but i'm pretty sure it's like 61 acres is the amount is how big they think the site of gobekli tepe is where multiple stone circles, regardless of whether that number is correct or not, it's the biggest megalithic site on the planet. Now, if you were to think about, we go back to where are we? I'll go back to share screen for a second. Uh, share that one. I mean, there is that. I mean, look, you, you got to just look at the Great Pyramid of Giza. I mean, we could talk about that to the cows come home. However, we, we won't get there in a minute. This is an interesting one here. Before we get to go back with Tepe, we talk about the impact proxies. So this is the Younger Dryas boundary field. So what you're looking at here is all the impact proxies that they have found so far, okay? And you can add a big fat one in Greenland now as well. They've found a crater 
under the ice in Greenland that's about 32 kilometres across. Uh, initial, initial dating puts it around that 13,000 years ago. Uh, now, the dating hasn't been done correctly, so that's not one we can hang our hats on yet. Our initial indications suggest that it could be the, that's the smoking gun, basically. That's the crater that everybody's been looking for. There's another diagram of the ice sheets. And you can see the ice-free corridor, and that's apparently where everybody walked down, uh, apparently. Um, understanding too that in the in the recent past that they've found settlements in America going back 60,000 years to 80,000 years now. Uh, so all the stuff that where we walked through the ice-free corridor and killed every single mammoth on the way, a lot of that's been blown out of the water. However, the narrative is still there. This is Gobekli Tepe. Precisely, this is Pillar 43. Before we get to Pillar 43, the thing about Gobekli Tepe that makes it very fascinating is you can see it's 3D relief carvings. So that means the carving is coming out of the rock as opposed to, you know, scratching your name in a rock that we've all done over the years. Now, the other thing is that it was buried, but it was buried on purpose, okay? So the reason we call it the Younger Dryas is there was a period of 12,800 to 11,600 years ago that was basically a mini ice age. And then all of a sudden, 11,600 years ago, everything goes, goes back to normal. And con just randomly, uh, agriculture and horticulture starts in Turkey. And that's basically where our history starts. All right. Um, if you remember back when we were in primary school, 13,000 years ago, what we were taught, we were basically monkeys in loincloths with bats. That's basically what they told us. Um, so what we're looking at here is Pillar 43. And you can see there's some constellations there. This is a, this is a star map. However, before we get to the star map, Gobekli Tepe was buried and it was buried on purpose. Now, because I'm in logistics, how do you purposely bury a site that is tens of acres in size without a dump truck or a backhoe or a bucket for that, for that matter, right? That's a lot of dudes with handfuls of dirt, right? Okay. So everyone looks past the fact that this entire site was buried on purpose. And it seems to have been buried on purpose right before that whatever happened at the 11,600 mark, whether that, so the, the, the postulations there are that instead of um, meteorites hitting the earth, they smashed into the ocean and the condensation went up into the atmosphere and basically cleared the atmosphere and gave us a reset, okay? It was buried just before the last cataclysm, uh, which was 11,600 years ago. Now, this is Pillar 43 and Enclosure D. Now, I won't go into it in great detail. I did a podcast on it uh, not too long ago. It's one of the better ones where I, I had like 14 pages of notes just on this one pillar uh, to, to try and unpack it. And there was a, there's a guy out of Scotland. Uh, one of them is Sidrikis, and I can't remember the other guy's name. I remember the Greek guy's name because that's the wog in me. Uh, but there's a guy that... They basically posited that it was a star map. And you can see here, obviously, the, the, the most common thing we can see is the scorpion there. And we can also see there's the bird, right? But you'd know about the handbags when you're Brendan, the handbags that are represented all over the planet. Handbags? Yeah, the, 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 these bags at the top. See the square with the, the circle at the top, those three bags across there? Oh, yeah. Every single major continent on the planet, including Australia, and in fact, the oldest representations of them are found here in Australia. Hmm. Every single continent has those handbags for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, Graham Hancock seems to think it was a stash bag of some description. <laughs> no one really knows. Right. Yeah, sounds about right. But no one really knows. Uh, so you can see here that you've got Scorpio, you've got Lupus. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's a dog in there somewhere. But basically, all these animals represent different constellations. And you can see Cygnus there, the swan, right? That, uh, that circle there represents where the meteorite came from. 
This is a star map from 12,800 years ago, but it's not just 12,800 years ago. According to Sid Rickus in the study that they did, I can't remember the Scottish guy's name. I feel bad about that, but that's okay. This star map lines up to four dates, mate. 20,000 years ago, 12,800 years ago, which is the time of the cataclysm, 4,000 years ago, and today. So the stars above Gobekli Tepe are very, very similar right now, if you could see it, but they put a big roof over it, of course, because, you know, you don't want something that's celestial aligned to be able to be seen. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the, the four dates that line up, and, and the question that I posited about the, in the podcast was, what if the most important date on that stone is actually today? It's got nothing, you know, it's because again, when we come back to the procession of the equinox with one degree being 72 years, which is the average age of life, uh, human life expectancy, um, 12,800 years ago is exactly half of the processional equinox ago. Yep. So, so we're, at, we're at the top of the circle. Okay. So we were, at, if we were at the bottom, now we're at the top of the circle. So Gobekli Tepe is basically unequivocal proof that there was, I mean, you don't just, the, the stories that I've heard about this are, are mind numbing. You know, you don't just, they say it was hunter gatherers. Yeah. Hunter gatherers built 50 different stone circles, astrologically aligned, geographically aligned, and then they buried it just for shits and giggles. Um, when they didn't have agricultural housing, something like that. And I think it needs to be said about a lot of this megalith stuff, mate, is that whilst I can see that slaves may have built some of it, I think a lot of it is craftsmen at the peak of their abilities and they're building it for a purpose. They're sending us a message that you don't carve, you know, we talked about in the last podcast, we had carving it into stone, you know, like you can't, there's a reason you carve something into stone. It lasts, right? If a cataclysm hit earth now, the only things that would be left would still be the Great Pyramid of Giza, would still be Baalbek, would be the stupid faces of, on Mount Rushmore, but not a whole lot after about 100 years. That's it. The stuff that is carved into stone will still be there. Everything else will be gone. So Gobekli Tepe is, is, the, is the, the pot shard. That's the unequivocal evidence that the mainstream archaeologists and anthropologists can't deny totally however when you look into it archaeology as a region of study has only been around since the 1930s that's the reality behind it it's not like this grand old thing that's been going on for so long you know without the rosetta stone of which i've got a copy of um to to my right there we would still have no idea what hieroglyphs mean. It was only by chance that the Rosetta Stone fell loose and then it's got three different languages on it. And to this day, that's how we decipher hieroglyphs. And that was only in the 50s and 60s. You know, we can talk about the Gosford glyphs a little bit later, which, which play into that as well. I mean, we could talk about the Great Pyramid. I did uh, probably one of the best early podcasts. I actually looked back at it. Um, preparing for this the other day it was episode 10 that's scary like that was 130 episode 20 episodes ago or something uh however it was the it was the best episode that we did it was myself and uh my mate angus we did one on go back um, on the great pyramid and um it uh did that work there mate did that have you got a yep all good all good okay cool i mean here's there's the great pyramids there you know, the, the, some of the evidence that some of your listeners might not be aware of is that there was a, a Japanese team and a German team that found a void in the Great Pyramid. There's a void somewhere in here that they're not sure about. It's basically the same size as the, as the King's Chamber. You know, it's pretty much undeniable now that these, uh, these pyramids are aligned to Orion's belt, Okay. And there's two stories that echo through the megalithic societies, mate. And one of them is the Palladian story and one of them is the Orion story. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. That is the, so this is Leo. This is directly out of Graham Hancock's book, okay? And the fact that in the pre-dawn of the vernal equinox, 
That's the other thing too. All this megalith stuff is lined up to either equinoxes or solstices. Um, with the sun some 12 degrees below the horizon, the Great Sphinx sort of goes directly at his own celestial counterpart, the constellation of Leo, uh, which experienced what astronomers call a helical rising at this moment. So that means that the Sphinx is not, you know, that's BC, so that's prior to 13,000 years ago. Could even be 26,000 years old, the Sphinx. And, you know, there's um, uh, there's uh, Mystery of the Sphinx that was a, done by John Anthony West. May he rest in peace. We lost an icon there. Uh, his work is invaluable. It's amazing that a lot of this work that is, is very easy to digest and makes a lot of sense is it really hinges on like five or six guys around the world um, that, are, that are basically giving the middle finger to mainstream archaeology and anthropology. Obviously, there's water erosion in the Sphinx. I don't think I've got any of the Sphinx stuff here. There's another, like, there's Gobekli Tepe. There's another uh, evidence. There's one circle, two circle, three circle, right? They're finding them everywhere. And you can see how deep it's buried there. Look at that. You can see how deep it's buried. And it's buried down to the base. I mean, look at some of these bases, mate. You know? Look at that. Like, that is a, a base sitting on a base sitting on a base. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, yeah, the evidence of that is, is, is it's mind-boggling. If you sit back and actually think about it, it boggles the mind as to what was going on 12,000 years ago or 11,600 years ago. And uh, are we any, did you, have you made any headway, because uh, you mentioned it, um, as far as finding out how they did actually bury this site? Oh, it's one of the questions, mate. So during the journey and unlocking the code, I see myself as a synthesizer of data. So basically I, I, I can bring, a, one of my gifts is I bring a lot of data into my head and then I can make it make sense to other people without going into the great detail. But what I do is I look for holes. And one of the things they don't talk about is how did they bury it? Like, I mean, I, I spent 10 years in mining and construction and oil and gas. You know, you're talking about 300 ton dump trucks to try and move the amount of earth that we're talking about to try and bury this thing on purpose. And the way they know it's buried on purpose, and look, we could talk about the accuracy of carbon dating, for, but that's probably not for tonight. However, the carbon dating from the top, from, the, from basically the earth down to the base of these pillars is consistent. Um, so it was bar all buried on purpose at the same time. Um, Very no, one, no one talks about it, mate. This, you know, I look for things that no one talks about, and that, that's one of the things that no one talks about. It, because, yeah, how deep, it, how deep under the soil were that? Like those bases you were pointing out, how deep would that be? It depends on where you're looking at. So it's um, Gobekli Tepe means the pot-bellied hill. So if you if you're Digging at the top here, then, you know, you're looking 10, 15 metres. But if you're digging around here, it's not that deep. It's, and because the site is so broad and so large, the depth of where down to the base of the, of the circles would vary. But it's not, it's not like two feet or three feet. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's significant. Some of these pillars uh, are between, they're between five and 20 tonnes. Like some of these pillars are huge. Um, you know, it's it's next level, and obviously Turkey's not a real uh, good tourist destination at the moment. And this, and Gobekli Tepe is on the border of Syria and Iran, and it's not it's yeah you're not going to take your family there anytime soon, um, which is a shame because obviously with the conflict, the ongoing conflict in that region, means the research would stop. And there was a German archaeologist, I the, his name slips my mind right now, but he unfortunately passed away. He was the one leading the charge uh, with the excavation uh, up until a couple of years ago, but he unfortunately had a heart attack, passed away. There's another, that is a shame. Yeah, there's another picture. There's another look at uh, Pillar 43. And you can see here that it actually, it's all, it, it's all four sides. So it's on every side, there's carving. You can see there's just lines carved into here, mm -hmm. you know, on every side. 
Oh, that's Sakar. That's uh, that's Sakar. We don't want to talk about that. This is something that's probably not as well known. That we talked about a rhyme. So the Great Pyramids, yes, Teotihuacan in Mexico also lines up to a rhyme spell. Yep. And there's a lot. There's a whole uh, a whole province in China that is nothing but earth and pyramids. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, and uh, Graham Hancock tells a story where he went to China to ask them about the pyramids and what they were for. And they basically said, oh, we've got time. We don't, you know, we'll look at it when we're ready. But they're very old. No one really knows. But the Chinese are like that. You know, they're, they're, that's a, that's a civilization that we, we understand little about. Uh, but we're circumnavigating the globe 500 years before the Spanish were in boats four times the size of Spanish galleons, basically giving shit away. Uh, and then the current reign of emperors decided to close the borders 500 years ago, and that's the China we deal with now. But prior to that, they were uh, they were a global, globe-faring civilization in massive boats. Um, and I think when we look at this megalithic evidence and the stuff, it, it echoes everywhere. There isn't a continent on the globe or a piece of land on the globe that doesn't have some evidence, including the small Pacific islands to the north of us. There is there's evidence of megalithic uh, societies all over. In fact, in Indonesia, there's still a province in Indonesia that makes megalithic stone faces and stuff to this day. They, they still do that to this day. Well, there's something you might have seen before. That's Aussie Stonehenge, but we're not going to go there yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> something that a lot of people don't know as well that I share with is that the Great Pyramid is eight-sided it's not four-sided okay you can see there's a line down the middle and you can actually only see that at certain times a year now we talk about the Great Pyramid for a second because I think the the, uh, the King's Chamber tombs coming up in this set of, set of pictures that I've got We've got to remember that each of the three pyramids was cased in limestone mm -hmm. and it was polished to a high sheen. Now, if that is an eight-sided pyramid, if you add the capstones to the eight-sided pyramid, that angle would have been more prominent. Okay, you would have been able to see that. Now, it was said that the capstone is the, you know, one, the, the missing uh, capstone of the, the Great Pyramid. Uh, Matthew O'Reilly does a really good book with Jack West about that, <laughs> uh, but that's fantasy. But that was said to be a golden pyramid with a massive diamond or crystal in the top. Now, if you were to think about, and this is something else that I hadn't heard anywhere else. So we, we, we've come up, you know, in, this, in the refinery here, we've come up with a fair few original UTC ideas, oh, original as far as I've never heard anyone else uh, posit them. The light would travel up that angle, hit the golden capstone at the top and create a beam that would go straight up into the sky. If you, and that makes sense to me. The interesting thing about the capstones too, mate, is that there's no evidence of them anywhere. The story goes that they were, an earthquake happened and shook a few loose and they built Cairo with them. But there's no evidence of polished limestone anywhere. Uh, it's also said in some of the earlier texts that they were covered in hieroglyphs, um, which you can only think what kind of job that was, you know, and you talk about the megalithic construction of the pyramid and you look into the, I think they say it took 20 years and there's something like, I'm, I'm pulling numbers, 2.3 million blocks weighing between five and 50 tons or 70 tons, some of the lintels. And the thing is, if you, we divided that out in that early podcast and it was something like one block every minute for 20 years, 24 hours a day, 300, no fuck ups. You can't make any mistakes every, every day, 20 years, every day. Can't make a single mistake ever. Right. Dragging it up the, uh, the, the mud ramps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we won't talk the mud ramp. <laughs> the mud ramp would be bigger than the pyramid itself. To get to get get the top stone on, like you, you'd be able to see the mud ramp in this photo would just go. <laughs> you, you couldn't even see where the mud ramp ended if that was the case, right? <laughs> um, the other interesting thing about the Great Pyramid is that there's 
mortar holding some of the blocks together. And we, we decided to do a deep dive on the mortar. It's like, oh, this, this will be interesting. I wonder what, what, what this is. And no joke, mate, you, you, you can search whatever search engine you want, whatever piece of research you want to do throughout the entire internet. There's one sentence about the mortar, and it goes like this. The mortar that is in between the Great Pyramid is of unknown composition is, and, and is still holding the blocks together today and cannot be replicated. Full stop. That's it. It's incredible that there's no further elaboration or, or just <laughs> at least an expression of astonishment or something. I mean, because that One is sentence. unbelievable. It is unbelievable. One sentence, mate. Yeah, actually, that the podcast that we did sort of went like, we we're going to do a podcast on the mortar, but this is the only sentence. Thanks very much. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, one sentence. But this, and what's interesting about it too, Brennan, is that sentence is repeats itself. It's the same sentence in all the articles, in all the things. It's like verbatim, right? And that makes me question why it is verbatim the same sentence over and over and over again. 100%. Uh, we, we might have a chat about some technology later or what I think the technology what is, what was or could have been, remembering this is my perspective only. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But, yeah, the Great Pyramid itself, you could spend, and I haven't been there, like it is on my list. Uh, once my daughters get a bit older, we're, we're going, basically. It's, there's, there's no ifs, buts or maybes, we're going. Um, and, you know, you listen to guys like Ben from Uncharted X, he's excellent. He's been there a bunch of times. There's so many cool guys now that are embracing these stories and, 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 and looking at them. And I suppose from this little humble Aussie podcast uh, out of my shed, we're just trying to provide another perspective. Be objective, be observant, look at the streams of evidence and come up with what we think makes sense to us and, and pick the holes. You know, like how did they bury Gobekli Tepe? How? I don't understand. Because as you, it, yeah, they didn't have yeah. a bucket. They didn't have a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, speaking, there's another another Pillar 43. You can see that I've done a lot of research on Pillar 43 because the picture keeps coming up. Uh, another picture of Gobekli Tepe there. I mean, look at the, it's unbelievable, right? To, to, to look at, the work that would have gone into that. And the thing is, you're not going to do... The other thing, too, that a lot of people don't talk about as far as Gobekli Tepe is concerned is what level of civilization do you need to be at for this to be a project? How much of geometry do you need to understand? How much of uh, constellations and star maps do you need to understand? How, much, how do you... Geography, knowing where north is. How do you... you know? The level of science that goes into just putting one of these circles up as opposed to they're not real sure how many circles, people don't think about that. And the only way, the level of civilization you have to be at for this to be a project worth doing means food is taken care of, shelter is taken care of. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is well and truly all done. Yeah, you're not roaming around going, oh, when we're done with our 12 hours of putting carving stone, we've got to go find some berries. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've got to go and hunt, a, hunt an ibis or something. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> th there's no way that whoever built Gobekli Tepe was not already seriously established and understood mathematics, geometry, uh, astronomy, physics, you know, like, because, I mean, engineering, you don't just pick up a 20 ton pillar and place it on top you know like oh yeah what do you do yeah just grab that mate and just chuck it over there well how much weight? oh five times yeah she'll be right mate you know like how do you people don't look at this stuff deeper and, and ask these fairly yeah. simple questions just yeah. simple questions you know it's very fascinating that's one of the stones at uh balbeck as well there's there's a reference point there so there's a dude sitting on the cornerstone at Baalbek. And that stone is, you know, I think it finishes down there somewhere, right? Yeah, you, 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 I think I've got a, I'm sitting in a, a nine by six shed. So wider than my shed, twice as tall and as long as my driveway, longer than my driveway. 
and they put it on top of these other stones that was, and it was down a hill. It's not plausible, mate. Like I don't, it, it, again, I look at it from a point of view that I've literally moved stuff by air, sea, road, rail, dump trucks that, you know, dump trucks that run over Hiluxes and don't even feel it. I've moved those things on trucks and ships and stuff. I've moved big stuff. I know what it takes to do that. It's not plausible. Completely agree. How big, how heavy would you estimate? Do they, have they estimated that stone that you pointed out? How heavy are we talking? They're between 900 and 1600 tons, depending on which one you look at, because they're all different. They're all different widths and lengths. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they're cutting the stone as big as they can, but obviously also all stone has uh, different fail points and stuff. So I imagine at some point, but the other question is, Brendan, and this is another thing they don't talk about, how did they cut it underneath? <laughs> if you're going to use, okay, if you accept that some stone chisels from the middle of nowhere came out and materialised into existence, because uh, they didn't have iron back then either, let's not think about that, okay? We had some dodgy bronze. That was about the best we could do. I think um, I, I really just, <laughs> when you raise that point, you know, all of a sudden you've got to figure out mentally you know, you, automatically I find myself trying to like rotate this humongous slab of what, 1,600 tons in space. How do they, to, because you've got to get access to all sides of it to flatten them and, and shape it. And so yep. what, are the, what the hell technology does it take to do that? And was it something, and I suspect it was probably something either, and I thought it was very interesting that there was this idea advanced by a bloke who was very obscure, but he, he suggested the idea that back when they were doing this stuff, gravity itself was actually a weaker force um on the planet at that time and i thought that was a really interesting idea i've never really followed up on it um but yeah if there's... Not that, then maybe some sort of anti uh anti-gravity technique or technology that we know exists in certain circles the tibetans still have traces of it uh -huh. and um that that would seem to be the way that they could have maneuvered these things through the air because they're cer they certainly weren't doing it with ropes and pulleys and freaking logs and stuff like this uh, exactly and Look, we can talk about that because considering you open that wormhole, I think <laughs> that, and it is, it's not a rabbit hole, it's a wormhole. Um, yes, I think some sort of anti-gravity tech. I, I think harnessing, if we truly understood how to un, um, harness the, uh, how to harness the magnetic properties of the earth, I think there's something to be said in that. Um, there is a theory that, uh, yeah, the gravity may have changed. There is, but I think that it's to do, there's magnets, there's sound, light, and vibration, okay? Uh, I think Tesla said if we understood sound and if you understood sound and light and vibration, we could harness the universe, basically. But there is the anti-gravity tech that you can't deny now with obviously with the continued unveiling of the USOs and UFOs uh, being released by the Pentagon in bits and pieces. You know, that apparently in Egypt, they say that there was a magical lathe and that that lathe was the basis of all their technology. I mean, if we, if we go back to the Great Pyramid, it, sets, uh, it sits on limestone, okay? Uh, and my mate who, who helps me with the podcast every now and again, he used to build roads. And so the plus or minus, if you want to get a nice flat, so say you're making a lay down yard and you want it to be flat, <coughs> excuse me, plus or minus uh, 20 mils acceptable, okay? Oh, no, yeah. I think roads, it's plus or minus 30, so that's three centimetres off flat is acceptable. I think that the Great Pyramid, I can't remember how what the actual square footage of it is, but what I do know is it is flat within five mil across the entire plateau, the whole yep. lot. We can, with the most advanced caterpillar excavator with laser GPS sharpened diamond blade and the, and the, and the gnarliest operator from the back of Burke that you've ever seen in the world could not do that today. We just couldn't. Yep. It, it, it suggests some sort of laser light sound vibration technology, you know? Yeah. Uh, and one, one we, we, you know, we talked about the mortar before, one of the ideas that we played with is that if you are shaping blocks, 
Because the thing about the Great Pyramid and the other pyramids as well, we don't talk about the other two as much. That's another thing too. So what about the other two? They're just as important, probably, you know, depending on how you look at it, more important. Um, it's just the big, we like the biggest, you know, everything's got to be the best and the biggest. Uh, but each block is individual. It's not like it's uniform. So each block was made to fit into that space. So if you have a, a laser, let's say, some sort of sound light laser, and you are shaping the blocks like a light, for want of a better description, a lightsaber with two handles on the end, right? Bzz, right? And you are melting the stone to a point. And we can talk about melted stone in South America if you like. But if you are melting the stone to a point and then, you, and then the last thing you do is you slice the ends and you butt it up against one another, maybe that mortar is actually the molecular breakdown of the stone mating up against each other which is why it's of unknown composition because it's broken down the mortar or broken down the, the granite to a point that it is molecular structure has changed and it might even be liquid. And interestingly enough, the guys at MIT, I think you can, they have actually cut granite with a laser and it's about 3000 degrees. That's how much the laser had to get to, to drill through the granite. Um, or no, it's, yeah. The boys at MIT at, uh, at Boston are, are, are cutting granite with a laser, but granite boils or it liquefies at 3,000 degrees Celsius. So if you had something, if you had a laser that was 3,000 degrees Celsius, you could cut the end off, made it up against the other one. That means that end of the granite is in the liquefied state, join it together like glue. That, you know, it sounds crazy. However, Explain to me another idea. You know what I mean? Explain to me what else yeah. it could be. It just gets exponentially more ludicrous from the point of view of trying to explain it in conventional terms because once you've explained that part of, part of it, you've still got to move the thing in space and transport it and, and line it up. And I mean, it's just, there's no way that we could do it using publicly available technology. No. And you talk about the lintels in the King's Chamber. I think there's five of them across and they're on an angle and they're joined together but their ends are flat. So they've cut something that's on an angle and had enough technology to cut it flat ends either end. And I think they're each 50 tons and there's five of them and you can't get a, a piece of paper between them. Like, what are we actually talking about here? How can yeah. we, how can anyone look at that and go, it was a tomb. It was not a fucking tomb. I'm trying not to swear in this podcast. However, I can't <coughs> deal with that. Okay. <laughs> what I did want to show, what I did want to show you was because um, I've got a a fresh. I'm just give me a second, mate. I've just got to find the. Is that there? Can you see that? Is that the king king sarcophagus? Uh, it's not showing up big yet. Not showing up big yet. Okay, give me a second. I'll stop share that. Go share screen. I'm learning all this stuff, mate. I'm learning. Learning on the fly. That's how we do it here. Keeping it real. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A mistake free all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what you're looking at there is the King's sarcophagus. Okay. That's the sarcophagus in the King's chamber. We could look in the background and have a look how tightly all the joins are between the stones inside the King's chamber and marvel at that for a minute. However, that is red, red or pink granite uh, is, as they describe it. That, so that, the, the king's sarcophagus, the box, we're just going to call it the box because it's not a sarcophagus, uh, is perfectly square inside. Now, I think of the numbers are in the, in the Megalith Logistics podcast. However, it's something like ungodly a number of RPM that you need to drill because that's one piece, mate. That's not, that's not something that's been put together. That's something that's been cut out from the inside. And yeah. in order to drill a core out, so how we would do it now is we drill core, 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 and then chisel it to make it pretty, right? There's no, like, there's no evidence that uh, it was some ungodly number of RPMs, water-cooled drill, diamond drill bits, blah, 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 in order to actually achieve that today. Now, another unlocking the code theory, and this one, this one's a little bit out there, but we're already down the rabbit hole. So is the Ark of the Covenant. 
apart from what Indiana Jones did to it, we know that the Ark is a, it's in every, everything that is described as a power source of, of great untold measure. And theoretically, uh, you know, Moses stole it and, and escaped across the desert with the Ark. Okay. Now, and the Pharaoh chased him down for 40 days and 40 nights through the desert and the Ark and a couple of other bits of technology provided them with sustenance between now and then. I posit, what if the Ark powered the Great Pyramid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Let's go there. What, well, the, the, so I, I, from, it's hard to get measurements of the arc. Okay. In the texts that give measurements of the arc, which are very, very old, it would fit inside that box, not with the handles, but the, the, the arc itself would fit inside that box. Okay. And understanding that the only thing that we know the only bit of text, and it doesn't matter if you read it backwards, forwards, whatever way you want to read it, the Great Pyramid was designed to transmit consciousness from the earth to the stars. That's what it was. That's what its purpose was. Uh, Chris Dunn does a really good job. He, he thinks it's a power plant, uh, and he goes into a lot of the, the engineering side of it. You know, some of these guys doing this work, it's, it's next level stuff. However, what if, mate? Because the thing is, if you if you're so let's say you know Moses escaped with the slaves and took off, right? Are you really going to chase a few thousand slaves across the desert for forty days and forty nights just because? But if they've stolen the key piece of technology that helps run your civilization, then yeah, you're going to give chase, yeah, for a long time, right? If if it was just normal slaves and what why would you do that i don't know you know it, it doesn't make sense but if they had the ark and the ark was key then maybe yeah absolutely uh theoretically the ark is in cambodia somewhere that's uh in a church in cambodia where priests priests look after it and they wear heavy metal chains because the ark is known to be radioactive uh and these, these priests die from like a radioactive sickness, but no one's allowed in to see it. Wow. Apparently. So, yeah. And there she is in all her glory. Yeah. The other thing is too, mate, what you got to understand about the Great Pyramid is that underneath there, they dug like the Queen's Chambers underneath the ground. It's 70 metres. They dug through the limestone. So did they do that first or they do that after? Like how, and how do you just cut perfectly square tunnels into limestone? again with with no tools mind-boggling um, no matter which way you slice it it's just absolutely mind-boggling yeah so there's a there's another uh another look at the king's chamber yep. look look at the size of the slabs on the floor but also polygonal masonry they curve up that's a corner piece look at that All right so that's not that actually that piece looks like it's not two pieces that's one piece mm -hmm. so that's a right angled piece you know you can't even uh, begin to understand it. This is something that I haven't looked into, but I did want to share with you. Ah, uh, I think I know what you get, where you're going here. So that's China, that's South America, that's Egypt, that's Orion's belt across the globe. Now, that's not something that I've looked into. I don't have any, uh, any more evidence, but it's not the first time I've seen that. Um, that the representation of Orion's belt may be on a global scale mm. as opposed to um, as opposed to just the but and, and these three sites that's Teotihuacan, Egypt and Xi'an province where the three main representations are. So mate, did you want to talk about anything else um, before we? move on to oh actually there you go there's there's some of the water erosion around the sphinx understanding that the last time it rained there was over ten thousand years ago and i think for us aussies because we've dealt with erosion our entire lives in our clay-based soil we've seen that kind of erosion in, in creek beds a thousand times 
there's no no questioning that that's water. You know, it's it's not even to me, it's not even a question. You know, growing up in central Victoria with all the clay base there, you get a big storm come through, and all the creek beds look like that. They all look like that. That's how that's how it looks. You know. And uh, the the Sphinx. I mean, I don't know if you want to go there, but yeah, we can uh, go there. Where do you stand on the Where do you stand on the on the Sphinx's head and the uh, fact that it's pointing towards Leo? That it may have been a, the whole thing was probably a lion. I think the whole thing was a lion. To be perfectly honest, at one point in time, like you can see there from the picture that the head does not match the body. Um, Very there, is, there is the uh, mystery of the Sphinx as well. It's a it's a great uh, DVD. I've actually got two copies of it. I found them in an op shop. Uh, and I've watched them about three or four times each. And it, within and look, there's there's a couple of different things about the Sphinx. Number one is the face of the Sphinx does not match the face of the pharaoh that supposedly did it. Okay, because the thing about Egyptians is they didn't mess up a face, right? The, the statues of certain pharaohs are exactly the same. Doesn't matter which way you look at it almost like they had some sort of 3D printer, okay? However, the other side of it is, is obviously the nose is missing. And the crown is missing off the Sphinx as well. It's said to have a serpent crown on top, okay? Um, look, there's some interesting stuff there. There's, uh, so you talked, you just said Leo. Do you know who named the star signs? Uh, refresh me. <laughs> no one does. No one knows who named the star signs the star signs. It is just what it is. So Leo, yeah. so Scorpio, Pisces, no one knows. No one actually knows who named those star signs. It's just been the way it has been. Um, for as long as we know. For as long as we know. There is a, and look, and it's not just that nose on the Sphinx that has been knocked off. There is a range of noses all over Egypt that have been chipped off. Uh, and there's a line of thinking that it may be the nose of an Indigenous Australian as opposed to anything else. It may be a different type of nose, not, and that's the reason that it is, uh, there's all the noses chipped off. Because the Egyptians did talk of a great people to the south with great knowledge. Okay. Yep. Well, uh, and, and that that uh, that opens up some other interesting discussions about carry on and what have you. I don't know if you want to go there if we have time, but um, there was definitely a link, and um, I think it was actually I learned this from the Strongs, um, Steve and Evan, who are friends of mine, and that they pointed out that as far as recently as the 1930s, it was actually public knowledge that the Egyptians had been sailing out to Australia as recently as 400 years ago yep. to learn from the originals. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. So we'll just, let's have a, um, I'll, I'll minimise that. Let's let's come home. Let's come home. There's more let's information on that. There's more information on that. So you can see there. Uh, the also, also the one that is, the, the other one that I've seen is that the modern microchip is actually in the shape of Orion's belt. We might be reaching a little bit there, but, you know. <laughs> uh there you go. So what we have here is a visual representation that was done by Richard Patterson. Uh, that is what is being dubbed and made that uh, I'm doing some work with Richard uh, behind the scenes. He was the one that found the original documents that were the survey documents of that site uh, at the Historical Society in Mullumbimby. Uh, originally okay. back in 2014. Uh, the Strong Boys did assist with some exploration and stuff like that, and they've done a few articles on it, but Richard was the guy who originally found the documentation. And, and I've actually, I've had been privy to the documents, and they're amazing. Like, I, I wish I could take a week off and just read them and then read them again and read them again and read them again. What you're looking at there is, is a representation of, of, of what would be Australia's Stonehenge. Um, this is some of the stones that they found at the Stonehenge site. This is from the Strong Boys. <coughs> this is some of the digging that they did at the site, the Strong Boys, um, some of the stuff that they found. Um, 
it's too it, too much detail for tonight, but um, let's go back because there's a better picture. Where did we go? Oh, there, there's some of the some of the detail of the crater in Greenland, mate. That may be the smoking gun of the meteorite hitting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's some the, of the. What can you tell us about it? It's it's basically it's 32 kilometers wide. Uh, it's hidden under ice, and it's only through lidar that we've been able to find it. So laser, laser infrared detection and radar. It's a new type of technology um, that has also opened up in South America. So they, they've gone over Greenland, found that. But they also estimate that they found in South America, once upon a time, they said between maybe two and four million people inhabited South America in the megalithic societies, Aztec, Inca, Olmec. They now, a mine, I should add in there too, they now estimate that at one time there was up to 110 million people that inhabited South America. Based on the, and they found highways with using LIDAR that are 20 plus kilometers long, dead straight, by the way. Um, so, you know, what does it take to be able to do that? Um, and they didn't have cars or oxen or anything. There's a good picture of the crater. So that's the LIDAR image of the crater in Greenland. Yeah. And basically, they're saying that there's a tip there, which is interesting because some meteorites when they hit they actually they form this tip and you can see some of that through uh when you look through a telescope uh at the moon there's another picture okay. of the of the crater there okay but that's all underneath ice at the moment we can talk about ice mm. too if you want but um let's uh let's touch on it if you if it's definitely if it's germane let's go there so ice or global warming, okay? Let's not, um, <laughs> so one line of research that I haven't, I haven't done the podcast on this, but I've got about 30 pages of notes on it. Uh, I haven't got any of this stuff here, but basically what I've come to understand is that the ice chases the poles, the ice chases the magnetic poles. So currently, the South Pole is moving east, okay? So if you look at where Australia is, where the Antarctica is, it's moving east of us, okay? Uh, and it's, it's, it's also currently marching into Siberia at a fairly accelerated rate. Now, yes, the ice is breaking on the other side of Antarctica. Yes, it is. That is happening. And it is melting. It is breaking. But where the pole is moving is unprecedented ice growth ice chases the magnetic poles okay it's the same in the northern hemisphere and that obviously me saying that means i'm a climate change denier so that doesn't get any press i'm pretty <coughs> sure you, that i'm pretty sure that makes you a nazi um and white supremacist so i'm afraid i can't have you back <laughs> that's it we're over that's it no we're not we're not doing it anymore um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so my research says that the ice chased the poles or the ice does chase the poles. And if you look at where, so, you know, the equator is the hottest part of the world, okay? Because the earth sits on an angle, where the sunlight hits us in the middle is not actually where the equator is. So it's got nothing to do with the sunlight. It's got to do with where the magnetic field meets and is actually less. That is where it's hottest because the, the ionosphere that is protecting us from the UV rays is at its shallowest there. Now, because of where the poles are now situated on our planet, yes, that is around the middle. But it is fairly common knowledge now that the poles shift, okay, and have been shifting for quite a while and may be currently shifting. I mean, that's one of the, the, the next things is, oh, the poles are going to flip on us and, Something's going to happen. Um, I think there's evidence in uh, tree rings in Japan that it happened. Uh, I'm not sure. Numbers not coming to me. But there is, there is a tree in Japan, an ancient tree in Japan that has evidence of pole shift. So let's pretend for a second that 
well, let's pre- let's pretend a few. We're going to we're going to go into a fairyland. We're going to pretend for a second that the geologist understanding of what the Earth looks like with the crust and the magma and the lava and then the the layers and then the big metal liquid ball in the middle is what it is. Okay, because that's not actually true. That is just an educated guess. Um, that's not actually. The, there's no evidence. There's, no one's drilled deeper than 26 kilometers into the Earth, and at that point they didn't get into the hot red shit, so they don't actually know what is there. So we'll leave that alone. But let's pretend that that's the case, all right? And there's a there's a there's a, a molten metal ball at our core that's spinning and generating magnetism, but that that ball can spin and can move as it has currently been moving for the last 100 years, 200 years that we've been measuring it. What if to say, so what if the pole, because as you would know, in Antarctica, as the ice melts, they're revealing trees and growth. So at some point, Antarctica was free of ice. So what if the pole, just for shits and giggles, was, so say where Australia is, what if the pole was underneath the earth and the pole, like think about the ice sheet, mate. I would say, and this is this is where it all sort of came about, like that Laurentide ice sheet that I showed you, that's a fuckload of ice, man. I reckon the North Pole was somewhere there. So if you put the North Pole there, then you then you spin it around and get the set the South Pole um, on the other side. It puts it somewhere in the ocean off Antarctica, which would then shift. But that would then shift the weather patterns as well, Brendan. Okay, because the reason it rains at the equator is because that's where the mag- magnetosphere is at the least. That's where the that's the heat and everything builds up through the ocean. So what if the magnetic pole shifting, that would leave Antarctica free of ice? What that would also do is would probably put the inland sea in Australia because Australia would be tropical because that is where the magnetosphere would be least effective. You follow me what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, 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 look, that, as I say, I've got a fair bit of uh, evidence on that, but it's not something that's probably the first time on the podcast that I've actually gone into detail in that. Um, But it's fascinating, mate. It's very fascinating. But let's say the impacts too. So multiple impacts, bang, 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 bang. Melt that ice. What if that shook the poles? What if that shook, you know, the vibration that that has through the planet into the core? You know, they they estimate that with the, the dinosaur impact that the earth rang like a bell for a million years because of the the level of that impact so each time that happens what if that messes with the core and it it spins it around you know like these things need to be questioned but and look i'm not just for the record i'm not saying that humans aren't contributing to the destruction of the planet we are fucking it on an in an unprecedented rate however to pretend that this earth doesn't go through its own cycles doesn't go through its own it's got its own thing to do right Mother Nature will kick our ass if she chooses to. Um, but yeah, yeah. that the, the op- what you're saying, what you're saying, yeah, I agree. And the the human human output of whatever human activity in general doesn't have anything to do with the shifting of the poles. And the shifting of the poles is what's generating climate change yes. and catastrophic climate change. So that's got nothing to do with us. Uh, yeah. we're just, like you said, yeah. we're, we're doing lots of other stupid stuff and destructive things, but we're not changing climate. Right. Um, that's part right. of the solar system, the the galactic uh, dynamics of the electric universe, um, the, the electric charge that gets exchanged between solar systems. And, I mean, it's a whole integrated network set up here. Like there are, as I say, there are no islands in an electric universe. So it's not even um, that it's generated, that weather patterns are generated on the planet that you're focusing on. Like we focus on Earth because we live here doesn't even get generated here it's part of a, a massive massive tapestry that yeah. we, we are only just starting to realize so anyway sorry i interrupted there no no totally fine mate i think it, it, one of the things the research that i've done points to is that we, we we must understand that we are part of a galactic uh framework you know you, you want to go electric universe you want to go multi-dimensions you want to go strings you want to whichever way it goes and i'm not really i find all of them entertaining and plausible in their own ways regardless of whichever one it is, we are part of a galactic 
neighborhood and we don't <coughs> we don't honor that we don't actually understand that because you know you talk about electricity electricity has taken away our ability to observe the stars you know um one of the things that working in the middle of nowhere gives you mate is is perspective you know when when it's literally you and two other blokes or three other blokes and there's no one else for 300 k's in any direction and the sun goes down and you turn the lights off and you look up and there's the milky way in all its bloody glory you're like holy shit we are nothing you know we are we there there is so much but yeah the, the the magnetic poles affect the weather and i think that at one point that ice sheet that was over north america was where the pole was and if you do that slip it underneath antarctica is now free of ice or at least the the side closest to australia and majority of that maybe would have been free of ice uh, i've actually got a a small globe in here somewhere where i've actually drawn it to to try and give me some sort of reference point it's fascinating yep. stuff mate it's fascinating stuff so we'll we'll move towards the end so there's there's i'll, I'll give you uh three choices four choices before we go to australia would you like to go to atlantis oh i have always want to go to atlantis well we can mate if you really want to we just need to most of it's underwater now uh so <laughs> <laughs> okay so atlantis we let's do it <clears throat> Most of what we understand about Atlantis come, well, all of what we understand about Atlantis comes from uh, Plato, okay, and and his his writings of Atlantis. However, what he does in those writings, and look, I am shortcutting about thirty hours worth of Randall Carlson and the Serpent Brothers podcast. He's got a co podcast called Cosmographia, and he goes into like seriously thirty hours or so of explaining why atlantis is where it is if you take plato seriously um and there's no reason not to take plato seriously he was right about a lot of stuff um interestingly enough we go back to the ice sheet okay we go back to the ice sheet and we go to give me a second learning on the fly here again zero mistakes all the time uh, <laughs> give me a second okay so there's the ice sheet just for shits and giggles remembering that at some at, at points in that ice sheet it is two miles deep i want you to try and fathom the weight of that for a second it's in the trillions of tons mm -hmm. remembering that a trillion is a billion billions okay um that's a that big fucking number, okay? It's hard to try and wrap your head around. <laughs> so, give me a second. No, I'm going to... I'm Hang on a sec, mate. Zero mistakes, zero mistakes. Here we go. 100% guaranteed every night. That's it. <laughs> Just give me a second, mate. Let me find the one I'm looking for. Uh, uh, okay tectonic plates that's what i want did that come through yeah, actually there we go uh, not yet not yet it's okay not yet zero mistakes zero mistakes <laughs> <laughs> if we keep saying it it's true <laughs> absolutely we just keep saying it's true okay they are the tectonic plates as we understand them on the planet right now Okay, we can see here, this is the Atlantic Ocean. Just say that word for me, Atlantic Ocean. Do you know who, named, know you do you know who named the Atlantic Ocean? No, I don't. No one does. It's always been the Atlantic Ocean. Hmm. Take the C and add an S for me, Atlantis, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's think. <coughs> so the ice sheet is here over Canada and North America. I'm going to use your ass in this next example, okay? Because your ass is creating what they call isostatic depression. Okay? Oh, the, sorry. sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> the weight of your ass is pushing down that cushion, lovely cushion seat you've got there. 
Mm-hmm. But when you get up, well, you probably sit there a lot. Your ass print might be there, but it, it rebounds to a certain point. Okay. So if we were to say that if a, Atlantis existed in the Atlantic, because that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Okay. So here we are. Big, massive bit of ice over this. Remembering that the tectonic plate basically runs through there. Okay. So if there is trillions of tons of ice on that tectonic plate on this side of the plate, that is then creating, I'll just stop share. That is then creating a, like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the other end of that plate, which exists in the Atlantic ocean would have been above Mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what is here now? Excuse me, mate. The Azores Plateau. Okay. Now, off the coast of Spain. So it's, it's up here, actually. It's up here somewhere. So basically, Plato said that through the pillars of, uh, of, of Heracles, which is here, due west, you found Atlantis. Okay. And again, the, the tectonic plate goes through there. So when the meteorites remember bang 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 into that ice sheet not only did it melt them and raise the sea level 400 feet in a matter of two weeks it also released all the weight off that tectonic plate so then the plate that was like this now goes like that yeah what's the story of atlantis it sunk beneath the waves very fast (laughs) very quickly yeah um yeah And if you go to the Azores Plateau now, they're doing a lot of underwater archaeology. And to put it into perspective about how much, um, how much land is now underwater that once wasn't prior to the last cataclysm, it's 10,000, oh, sorry, 10 million square kilometres. was above water 13,000 years ago that is no longer above water. And the other thing to that too is... That's a lot. That's a lot. The other thing too is, mate, what, where are all our cities? Where are all our cities now in this great, awesome civilization? Oh, usually on the coast. On the coastline, yeah. For, uh, Mm, just, just for. We're the most vulnerable. Yeah. So, and just for, to put it into perspective, a 12 meter tidal wave, (coughs) excuse me, if it hit the Gold Coast, would wipe out the Gold Coast and brush up against Mount Tamarine. Now, 400 feet is about 130 metres, give or take, to put that into perspective. Um, So the underwater archaeology is revealing on the Azores Plateau, stone circles, theoretically a pyramid, can neither confirm nor deny that one, Um, but there is stone circles under the water. And the Azores Plateau now it's common knowledge that they are tips of what were once islands. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we could go to Atlantis, man. I actually want to go to Egypt and then go oh, by. Wow. I want to go via the Azores on the way back. Uh, when we both All become... Right, well, I'm down with that. That sounds like a good trip. Well, that, that's what I'm saying, man. When we both become super successful podcasters, what we do is we get all the, we get, we get the posse together. We get, we, get, we get all the girls and the kids and the posse and we just go on a, on a global megalithic... I've got, I've got plans, man. I haven't got any resources, but I've got plans. <laughs> <laughs> I got dreams. <laughs> yeah, I got dreams, man. So yeah, I want to get more into Atlantis there, but geographically, that's where Plato said it was. And there is echoes of a megalithic civilization and the underwater archaeology that is ongoing is continuing to unravel that puzzle. Extremely interesting. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear the updates as they unfold, mate. Yeah, well, I, as I say, I, I, I'm so deep down this rabbit hole, I've got no flashlight and I don't even know where I am anymore. Um, so we ticked off Atlantis. I wanted to share something with you. So we could go, we could have a quick chat about Stonehenge, uh, Gimpy Pyramid if you want to go there. Uh, we could have a quick chat about Carry On. Um, unfortunately, they, they're going to try and turn carrying into a housing estate. Look, 
the strong boys do a really good presentation on carry on and I can do it pretty in a nutshell. Again, the ability to synthesize data, understanding that the Rosetta stone and our understanding of hieroglyphs, excuse me, didn't actually come to pass until the fifties. The story of carry on was, it was some world war two veteran who decided to just write a random story in the glyphs, in the rocks, uh, after World War One, but we didn't understand what hieroglyphs meant until after World War II. Uh, and, there, and you dig into that story and it's like, who did it? Oh, you know, old mate, you know, Jono, Jono's son, you know, butcher, fella, he did it. No one knows. It's bullshit, basically. Um, however, the Stonehenge, the, the Australia Stonehenge, you look, that name may change in the near future. As I say, I'm doing some work with Richard behind the scenes uh, here. He's become a pretty close friend of mine. Uh, he's actually in your neck of the woods, man. He's a very interesting guy. Uh, maybe if whenever I, if I can get down there, we might uh, go and have a coffee or something like that. It's uh, sounds good. Yeah. Um, he was the one that found the original documents. He's put a book together. Uh, I'll plug it. Look at Australia Stonehenge on Facebook. Uh, it's not a big book. It's about eighty or ninety pages with pictures and and his theory and his understanding of what he thinks it is. However. What, did it, what the echoes of it are is um, we may – life – how do you put this without um, – basically, this is where it may have began, okay? And I know, I know you're aware of that because obviously, you know, Stephen and Evan are, are good friends of yours. Uh, there's a better – actually, there's a better – that was the one I was looking for. There's the better understanding of the plates, Okay, yep. There's 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 the, the Pillars of Hercules, right? And we could talk about the statue of Hercules that the foot, they've got the foot, I think they found the foot, and the foot's like 15 metres by 8 metres, and that's the foot. That's not the, you know what I mean? Like, then extrapolate from there. Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just a just my, like, it's a, exactly. Um, oh, yeah, that, that's probably the better rendition of it. There's some more, that you'll be able to find. So this is basically a computer rendering of what is now at, at the moment known as the Australian Stonehenge site that was outside of Mullumbimby. Uh, the thing about Mullumbimby and Byron and that whole area there, if you open your eyes and widen your gaze, you'll suddenly find standing stones everywhere along there. They're all over the place. In fact, as you drive into Mullumbimby, the roundabout is nothing but standing stones, okay? And Richard did an investigation as to why they're there. And the, 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 the local government or whatever it is, oh, they were, we found those and we thought they'd look cool. So we just thought we'd put them on the entrance to Mullen Bimbit. There's, there's, there's <laughs> actually, and you would know the, uh, the mock stone henge that's down there, the, the guy that built a mock stone henge. I know of it. I think, I don't know if I've been there. Yeah, there's a guy that built a mock Stonehenge and Richard went to talk to him to see why he built a Stonehenge. And he goes, oh, I just thought it was a good idea. And Richard goes, where did you get the stones from? He goes, oh, they were already here. So that guy has built a Stonehenge out of stones that were possibly already a fucking Stonehenge, right? <laughs> okay? Um, this it boggles the mind, mate. But what you're looking at there, you might notice this symbol here, but the Celtic cross, medicine wheel, uh, that is another symbol that echoes around the globe. There's a family of about 30 to 40 symbols that they find in rock art, in megaliths, in engraving, in, in all sorts of stuff that are exactly the same all around the globe. And long story short, because uh, I've done a few podcasts on this, the guys can look it up. Australia Stonehenge and Richard Patterson. There's a few in the, in the back catalogue. Potentially, the, the original people here may have been the keepers of a spiritual knowledge. Um, and people from all over the globe may have come to actually learn from the Indigenous people. And what you see here is, is a transition. You would start at one end and you would go to the other. And along the way, there would be points where an elder would initiate you or something would happen. 
And one of the more interesting things that I want to try and um, go and meet this guy, there's a guy down there that Richard got in contact with who has a crystal that when you shine light through it, uh, puts a, a landscape picture on the wall. Hmm. Um, and the original writings uh, as part of the documentation talk a lot about crystal. And it's interesting that, and the indigenous traded in crystal. That's not, that's, that, that is also a known thing. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that what is down at Mullumbimby, that is the largest in the world, the crystal, what's it called? The, the, the um, crystal castle. Crystal castle, yeah. Right. That's got some of the biggest crystals in the world. And just by chance, it's in the, in the exact place where the originals used to trade in crystal. Okay. Yeah. They didn't care much for the yellow rock, the gold, but they loved the crystal. Mm -hmm. Because, and look, we could talk about that as well. Maybe not tonight. However, this would be an initiation ceremony. However, what I've learned through studying the documents is this is only one set of stones. If you were to believe the survey documents, understanding that this site stood until 1946 before it was bulldozed. Yeah. Um, this, was, this was only one of the sites. There was actually up to seven different stone arrangements on the site. Uh, not just the one. There was the major one, but surrounding it, there was different other stone arrangements. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you and you sort of tie it so let's say the egyptians came here to learn remembering the egyptians talked about a great land to the south also the the carry-on glyphs tell a story of uh egyptians that basically ran aground in their ship and basically one of them got bitten by a snake we've got a fair few snakes around here and they died and they were buried somewhere that is the basic story of the carry-on glyphs um, yeah. Yeah. Also, using hieroglyphs, the interesting thing about that is the set of hieroglyphs are a very old set of hieroglyphs. They're not the new hieroglyphs, they're old hieroglyphs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've heard, uh, I've heard Steve and Evan refer to them as proto Egyptian, some of yeah, them that old. Yeah, proto Egyptian, that's the one. Yeah. I actually had a picture that I wanted to share with you, but I won't, uh, I'm not going to probably. It'll take too long to get it for tonight. But look, there's a fair bit of consternation depending on which Facebook groups you follow about the Gimpy Pyramid at the moment. Uh, I spent, I went up there on four different occasions uh, with some of the Kabi people up there. I've also been there on another three separate occasions without them to investigate that site. It's fascinating. Uh, what's more fascinating is the polygonal masonry that is around the church. Um, have you seen some of that? I'm not sure that I have actually. Yeah, give me a second, mate. I'll, I'll bring some up for you. Uh, so this is probably one of the more interesting things that I've found on the site. I'm calling this the preparation stone. Mm-hmm. Um, because there is a, a and it's this isn't something that is just here in Australia, but there is an alchemist view that if you combine certain plants, it makes an acid that could cut stone. Okay. Okay. I don't know what those plants are because if I did, I'd be playing with it. <laughs> be trying to cut the concrete in the backyard. However, um, this I think is evidence for that. Okay. Because that's, that, that's my hatchet that I take with me on field trips as a, as a size reference. But you can see, I'll go, so this here, right? You can see that something has been prepared here, some sort of liquid or something. And if you look at it there, if we just, I can, you can see the lines where it's actually worn away the stone. Can you see that in the picture? Yeah. So I think that is where they would have prepared the mixture, okay? You can see here there's drag marks where they may have sharpened a tool of some kind. Okay. Uh, this big picture of the, of, the, of the drag marks. You can actually see there it's like that. I cleaned it up as best I can, but you can see where it's been dragged through. Okay. To sort of sharpen a, a, a tool of some kind. And you can see here 
that's where they did the test cut. Hmm. Maybe. This is all speculation, okay? But that is, um, that's probably the more interesting thing that I found, one of the more interesting things I found on my trips to Gympie. Yeah. Um, that sandstone was interesting, it was out of place. That was out of place. It was just there. Like that's not from around there. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, there you go. See, wannabe photographer. Um, two, two butterflies there. What species are they, man? Don't know. Blue ones, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, actually, hang on a second. Where are we? That's one of my favorite shots. Look at that. Caught him in the air. Ah, love it. Yeah, man. Oh, look, I, I, I do enjoy taking photos. However, the emergence of Instagram and everyone having a 20 megapixel camera in their pocket, uh, I, I gave away my photography dreams because what's the point? <laughs> it's a bit sad, mate, but you, you're doing well in the archaeological realm. That's right. <laughs> uh, so I'll just fast forward here, butterflies. What I did here, actually see all these pictures of random stones. I have an app on my phone called the D-Stretch app, which basically if there was any pigment, on these stones, it draws the pigment out of the stone. Oh. It's quite fascinating. And that's why I took a lot of these pictures to see if there was any carvings or drawings that may have been on any of these stones. Um, polygonal masonry. Okay, this is the more interesting stuff here. It's here at Gimpy. Now the story goes, and believe me, it's only a story. The story goes that this wall was taken from the site at the Gimby Pyramid uh, was moved from there and then in the 1930s was used as a depression era project to surround the church. Okay. Uh, the four guys that I went on the expedition with uh, to Gimpy, the last field trip that was fairly disillusioning, have said their 10 cents worth. And those podcasts are Unfortunate Truths, that my wife uh, interviewed me on that one. And then Unfortunate Truths 2 and The Musings of Madmen uh, is where we, we ended up. The, that's all the guys that are on that last field trip have put their 10 cents in, but I'll, I'll give a proceed version here tonight. Some of the polygonal masonry is quite interesting. Uh, that's the money shot there. Mm -hmm. That piece there, this one here. Lovely. Um, it's very, very interesting. But there's, there's two or three different types. There's two or three different versions of it you're looking at the good stuff there there's another pretty impressive piece here uh going around the corner and again so like a little edge cut out there yeah. it's it is fairly impressive polygonal masonry uh this is the good stuff but as we go along i mean this stuff remembering that it's been moved once or twice or three times depending on which story you believe um but i mean you know this piece here made for one two three four five pieces mm. uh, about here, so this is still some of the better stuff, but around here is where it sort of starts. The quality goes down. That one's interesting, like that square block to set up these five stones with that little mm -hmm. one in the middle. Understanding that these stones, Brendan, they're about 500 mil, 50 centimetres wide. So that stone is 500 long, okay? It goes all the way through to the other side. Sure. But then the quality starts to go down a little bit. Some of this stuff, I think, is better quality. Uh, but as it goes around the corner, this stuff, it's starting to get a bit lesser, okay? It almost seems like someone was taught how to do it and they were trying to catch up, okay? Yeah. So long story short, my theory on Gimpy is... Well, there's one thing. There's, there was gold from Gimpy found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. Okay. They know that because every single piece of gold has a DNA signature. And if we were to, to play that game, okay, so let's pretend the Egyptians came here to learn, the potentially the South Americans came here to learn. South Americans love their gold. Okay. And there was known to be alluvial gold, which is just nuggets sitting on the ground as, as late as the 1900s, okay? Um, so let's pretend for a second that that wall from the church, and look, there's a whole heap of consternation that I don't want to go into tonight. However, 
at some point, if I feel like going back there at the moment, I don't. However, if I do, I may measure the wall and try and put it onto the site. I don't know whether it fits, Brendan, if I'm honest, mate. But let's pretend that it does fit onto the site somewhere. I think, and to go back to a global perspective of megalithic stuff, I think the time frame that we play with is we've got it wrong. I think a lot of stuff is older than we understand and some stuff may be a lot younger than we understand. I think there's two ways, but I think the time frame on either way is, is very um, out of whack. And I think maybe that the Gimby Pyramid site, uh, understanding that there was a step pyramid in Tin Can Bay, that uh, very, uh, very heavy rumours around that, that that was bulldozed in World War II to make an airfield. Um, taking that into account and then taking the Gimby Pyramid site into account, maybe once upon a time the South Americans came here and showed the local Indigenous how to do some polygonal masonry, maybe even built them a shrine, a step pyramid as a, as a, as a, as a healing centre or as a appreciation or, or a gift or something. Um, and then that has now deteriorated over time. Uh, is it a sacred Indigenous site? Yes, to a point. Uh, however, I think it goes back much, much further than that and further than we actually truly understand. What's left there now? Not much, mate. Not much. And the land is taking it back um, every single day. At the moment, they're, the main roads are uh, putting a highway it needs to be said, putting a highway around it, not through it at all, okay? Awesome. Um, and you can see, yeah, there's, as I say, there's some consternation going on on, the, on Fedbook at the moment. <laughs> it's interesting to observe. However, what's been done has been done. Where I want to finish is an alternate origin story, Okay. If we were, so we're going to finish on a very woo-woo tack here, mate. I like that. I like woo-woo. Let's do it. Okay. So if Homo sapiens sapiens were made for this planet and evolved specifically for this planet, number one, we'd be able to swim better. End of story. Okay. On a planet that is two-thirds water, we can't swim for shit. Okay. If we actually evolved and were made for this planet, we'd be able to swim better, okay? And you can't actually deny that. Um, I don't want to get into theory of evolution because I'm just going to go woo-woo straight off the bat. Still. So there's two main indigenous myths. One is the, and it's basically the Palladian versus Orion, okay? So the seven sisters of the Pallades were chased by the three brothers of Orion across the stars and they came here to our little blue ball. What is the only unique thing about our little blue ball, Brendan? The only unique thing? One of the most unique things about this blue ball. Why would they come here? If, if extraterrestrials came here, why would they come here? Oh, there's lots of reasons of it. I, know, I think I know where you're going to go, but I can't consciously... I know I've got this feeling that I know where you're taking this, but please enlighten us all. <laughs> Life, Brendan. Yes, Life. <laughs> fairly obvious. <laughs> Life, okay? We have animals here. There is hominids here. Understanding that the, at last count, look, mind you, the evidence is very, very thin, but at last count, I think there's 24 different types of hominids that they've identified uh, that have existed on this planet at one time or another. Uh, Paracas skulls. When you want to look at something weird, look up Paracas skulls. That's another mystery that, we won't go there tonight because I'm, I'm in the middle of some, that's another, I've got like 15 different research things that depending on how I feel, I'll pick one up and go again. Yep. But yeah, practice skulls, look into that. Because <coughs> everyone goes like the Anunnaki thing is gold. There's entire asteroids made of gold in the cosmos, right? There's, there, there is chunks of ice in the Torrid Media stream that are, bigger than this planet. So it's not water, okay? Wood is very unique to this planet, actually. Timber is one of the unique things to this planet, but it's life, mate, life, yeah. okay? So the story goes that 
the Palladians came here, but they couldn't exactly uh, exist on this planet because they are, or as the story goes, a silica-based life form. Okay, uh, you know the Strong Boys. Uh, this is actually another piece of the research that I'm, I'm doing, um, and I'm going to actually I've I've, I've done a, a podcast with Stephen, uh, and I wanted to I'm going to get back in touch with those guys because the, a lot of those stones, you know, the stones that they have, uh, that is a lot of those stones from some of the research I've been doing is australite tektite, mate. Okay, tell us uh, about that. So australite tektite is a silica-based type stone that entered our atmosphere about 780,000 years ago. Now, a guy by the name of Bruce Fenton, uh, he had a psychedelic experience <laughs> and basically connected to he he envisioned himself flying a crystal spaceship, a smaller one, and he watched a larger spaceship crash into a planet. Now, for whatever reason, he pulled on that string, not expecting to find anything. Valerie Burrows, which I know the strong guys know as well, she's a, an indigenous lady. She is the basis of a lot of this story. Um, but so the story goes: the Pleiadians came here. They modified us from a hominid that existed here, okay, to create Homo sapiens sapiens, and they basically crash landed in, in Australia. The story being, and look, it's hard to know where you go. Again, we don't actually know. No one fucking knows anything. However, you know, there was a, there was a battle or something in the ship. We like to put human stuff into it. So there was a fight. Everyone's fighting. For whatever reason, the ship crashed into the earth okay now bruce thought is there any evidence to this as it turns out there is uh again zero mistakes let's see if i can find what i'm looking for always zero mistakes all the time ding 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 i think i'm going the wrong way we go oh there we go no there we go Okay, so there's three. Can you see that, mate? Yeah, mate. There's three main tectites uh, around the globe, okay? And they can explain Moldavite, but Moldavite's interesting as well. It's almost like uh, nuclear glass. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, these three, these are the three tectites that are found. Australite tectite, and you see the Australasian strewn field, okay? You find this stuff. Uh, all over Australia, and it's almost black. Sometimes it's round. Sometimes it looks like uh, teardrop shapes. Sometimes it looks like um, like semicircle shapes. It's very strange stuff. And the reason it's shaped like that, because if anything that comes in, like if a meteorite hits, mate, it's doing sixteen hundred kilometers, uh, sixteen thousand kilometers an hour. It hits hard. This Australite tektite basically didn't hit hard. And if you actually look at the NASA website, uh, the, it, NASA has studied this. And on the NASA website, they say that about, about 800,000 years ago, something was in a low Earth orbit over Earth, lost its propulsion or whatever it is, and basically slowly crashed into the planet. There is absolute evidence for it. And you can find this stuff everywhere. And a lot of the stuff that a lot of those, the, the Turinga stones that the Strong Boys have is Australite tektite. Yep. Uh, that that's something that I've confirmed over the last few days, um, which is interesting. And I had a trippy experience with those stones, but we won't go into that tonight. And the reason that it's um, these things around is they basically just, they slowly hit the planet and just sort of rolled basically. And you find them everywhere. If you were, you walked out in the bush for long enough, like out in the desert, you can see, you know, central Australia there. Um, Interestingly, Gympie or Eastern Australia is a big spot there. Just, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's actually Mullumbimby somewhere in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So basically, these Palladians, yeah, that's, the, that's the prevailing Indigenous Australian story. They modified our DNA to create Homo sapiens sapien. Now, the one, the reason that we basically, we're on the top of the heap now 
is their ability to communicate. However, and you're, you've got a little one now, and I'm sure you're talking to her and, you know, mum, mum, dad, dad, you know, you, you, you're, you're teaching her how to speak. Mm -hmm. Who taught the first people how to speak? Excellent it, question. It is a learned thing. <clears throat> so someone at some point had to teach us how to talk. Mm. Right? I, I, there, there is evidence that went from grunts to pointing or whatever. But the, the eloquence of communication is the reason we're at the top. And genetically speaking, uh, I think um, there's a great YouTube documentary, 780,000. That goes for about 45 minutes. If you're looking for something to watch when you're nursing the little one, watch that. It's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, however, he talks about genetics and the fact that human homo sapiens sapien genetics have changed eight times over the last million years or something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm butchering these numbers. But whatever it is, over 70% of it has actually been in our brain, our, front, our prefrontal cortex and our ability to reason, okay? Because the other thing is too, mate, if you think about, you know, lions, tigers and bears, oh my, you know, wolves, we are not the best. We, we, the only reason we are the virus that currently exists on the earth consuming and consuming is their ability to communicate and to organize, yeah. right? Because we're not actually, there's plenty of animals out there that could really do some damage to us. Um, but our ability to organize and create weapons and communicate is the only reason that we're at the top of the heap. And if you think about from an evolutionary perspective, I think there were hominids on this planet that evolved on this planet, okay? Yet we were given a bump start. Now, the trippier bit of evidence about this is the ship exploded. Now, in the vacuum of space, if the ship exploded, then that means there might be Australite tectite on the moon. Now, we can talk about the moon another day. However, if you are to the, the rock samples that were brought back from the moon, within them, if you were to, if they were found on Earth, some of those rock samples would be Australite tectile. Sure, sure. So, and the other one is too, is it basically, yeah, and, and, and they, 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 the, the story goes that the space police came and basically told the, the Orions and Palladians to stop it and stop messing with the planet. And if they didn't, they were going to come back and throw asteroids at the planet. And Five, and they said, in 5,000 years, if you guys don't mess around, stop messing around, we're going to throw asteroids at the planet. Would there be evidence for that? As it turns out, at about 775,000 years ago, there is evidence of a multiple impact bombardment from separate sides of the planet. Okay, interesting. So it's like there's more hard evidence for some of this story being true then there is evidence that Jesus walked the earth. Yeah, sure. But it's 800,000 years in the past. But also what that means is that Homo sapiens sapiens existed on this planet, uh, existed and were potentially created here in Australia. So that means that we came from here, okay, out of Australia. Now, the spiritual culture that I believe once existed, and this is some of the, the other work that I've been doing in the background with Richard's help and through research, through looking at some of the strong boys research. Um, if you think about spirituality in a global sense, as far as indigenous spirituality, Brendan, it is pretty much exactly the same all over the planet. Okay. It's, it's honoring the elements. It's honoring mother earth. It's, it's honoring the harvest. It's honoring the nature. It's, it's it's itself it's these things and this this baseline i would almost say unique human spirituality in a, in a baseline sense yep. exists in the same form all over the globe so i posit that maybe this spiritual culture and this is through you know this is elaborating on some of richard's research and adding my own twist to it that 
multiple cultures from around the planet came here to learn about spirit, about the, the, the soul of spirituality. And I know you're all over that with, the, with your book and stuff like that. And, but then they, they went back to where they went, whence they came and they kept the core lessons, but adapted it for their own locale. Okay. You know, you've got the Druids, you've got the Egyptians, you've got this, you've got that, you've got that. But the baseline spirituality, again, and we had this discussion a little while ago in one of the podcasts we did, the baseline religion, the, 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 what exists at the base of this is pretty much exactly the same the world over. And there's a set of symbols that echo the world over. There's, and this megalithic society echoes the world over. You know, And the destruction, the unequivocal destruction, we talked about the noses being taken off in Egypt, they very much concentrated the destruction here in Australia. Like they wiped everything out that was anything to do with, with uh, the indigenous being more advanced than they, than they were, which we, we were told, especially as us as kids, you know, we weren't told anything, but that echoes around the globe too, mate. They did that in India. They did that in America. They did it in South America. There's another thought pattern of mine that I, I see, uh, you know, we talk about the global cabal. I see something going back past the Trojans that is almost a, a, a systematic destruction of, ever, of, of this spiritual culture that once existed because the materialism needed to rise up as opposed to understanding spirit on a deeper level. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a very, that's, I mean, that's a very interesting thread, mate. I'm going to have to wrap this up. We've been, uh, we've been going strong for a good, or at least a couple of hours. So hey, mate, what I, do you, what do you, what do you <laughs> I don't want to like, you know, shut down all the interesting rabbit holes, but I've got to go to bed at some point. Yeah, I know, man. I'm, I'm the same dude. I've got, I've got a five o'clock start tomorrow. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, look, there's a thousand things to say, mate. I think be open-minded again those that have listened to this podcast get in touch with me if it doesn't make sense if you don't think anything that i've said doesn't make sense then get in touch with me i'm not tied to any of the ideas that i've talked to you about tonight all these ideas can change and mold and and it, with every new idea is a new perspective i'm not tied to any of them you know with a sufficient amount of evidence i'll change my mind tomorrow about anything that I've spoken about tonight. Because the one thing that I know, and, and this we talk about that global spiritual stuff, is the key, one of the keys to that is knowing that you know nothing. And I know that I know nothing, despite the plethora of, of evidence that I've, I've blurted at you tonight. Um, yeah. But mate, look, I just, I do appreciate your time. Um, I haven't got much else, mate. Um, there's some interesting stuff. I mean, I, I didn't mention Halloween. Um, we, could, we, we could finish on Halloween I could say that one pretty quickly uh, or do you want to alright yeah. All right. yeah, let's, let's tie it up with Halloween mate let's go let's go succinct Halloween conclusion <laughs> okay because it sort of does tie into everything we're talking about mate. so Halloween I hope so <laughs> it, it does Halloween or Dia de los Mertos is the day of the dead now what a, a, a bunch of anthropologists, archaeologists, and archaeoastronomers got together, and uh, oh, we did a podcast on this as well. So we did a. There's another podcast in the back catalogue on unlocking the code, unlocking, unlocking the code. I'm beginning to. It's I'm I'm, I'm at my end. Of, my brain's exploding as well, mate. Um. So the Torrid Media Stream. Twice a year, we pass through the Torrid Media Stream in June. At the end of June and the end of October into November, the Torrid Meter Stream is 30,000 kilometres wide. We orbit it about 2,000 kilometres a day. It takes us about 15 days to pass through it. And we do that every year and have done for tens of thousands. Who knows how many thousands of years we've done that for? At least 13,000 because that is, the culp that is the most likely culprit of where the meteorites came from. Uh, Graham Hancock, who I know you love, says that twice a year we put on a blindfold and walk across a six-lane highway and hope a truck's not coming in the other direction. Um, <laughs> they estimate that there is pieces of rock in that Torrid Media stream, thousands of them, 
kilometre wide and bigger. Underneath that, there's who knows how many thousands of three to four to 500 pieces of rock that are in that Torrid Media stream. So Halloween, the Day of the Dead. We may be celebrating 13,000 years later the day the world ended. Because mm -hmm. Halloween, the Halloween is October 31st. Now, what this study came up with is that multiple cultures in Asia, in obviously America, in Europe, in basically every major continent across the planet, they celebrate a day of the dead of sorts around October 31. Mm. If that is when the meteorites came out of the sky, smashed into the ice shelf and hit the reset button, then that means we are every year, there's an echo through time that we celebrate the day the world ended. Because what is Armageddon, Brendan? It's represented as floods, volcanoes, and rocks from the sky. And that's it, brother. That is it. There are certain things that we celebrate every year. Halloween's one of them. We could talk about not we're going to go into any more rabbit holes. But there's a few instances every year that we celebrate that we have been celebrating for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands a year that we aren't even aware of as modern humans. And Halloween is one of them, man. We may be celebrating every year the day that the world ended. And that'll do, mate. That's that'll do. That's, yeah. It's a hell of a note to finish on, mate. And you're giving, giving people plenty to uh, ponder on when they, when they, you know, on their own time. So, yeah, look, ladies and gents, I want to thank my mate Triff here from Unlocking the Code podcast for having a chat with me about alternative history and all this fun stuff. Triff, thanks, buddy. We'll do this again sometime, eh? Let's, 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 let's do it again. Thanks, mate. Cheers. <laughs>